Hello and good afternoon. Thank you all for joining. Uh, it looks like we've got um, almost every state represented. I was trying to keep track of all the different states and I lost count. <laughs> I like seeing everybody's welcome messages. Uh, my name is Jody Rodney and I am the Vice President of Marketing and Education for Plan Mecca USA. Uh, we've been doing this Plan Mecca Digital Mastery Series for the last month and it's been a, a great opportunity to to share information and to educate our customers and prospective customers and, and all of you out in the industry. So we thank you so much for joining us today. With us is Judy Bendit, and she's going to be speak speaking on ergonomic advancements in dentistry. Before we get started, I do have a few housekeeping items. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, um, all attendees are muted and not on camera. If you're experiencing any technical issues, please submit those via the chat function. At the end, we will open it up to questions uh, for Judy. Please submit those via the Q&A function. Uh, you'll find that at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, it says Q&A. And again, we will take some time for questions. We anticipate that Judy's presentation will take approximately 50 minutes um, before we dive into Q&A. We've had a couple people already ask how long this, uh, this uh, webinar will last. So it should be right around 60 minutes. We are recording the webinar and it, we will include the link in our follow-up email along with the post uh, webinar CE survey. Um, it will be included in the chat as well as in the post, uh, post webinar email. I think that's all I got. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Judy. Take it away. Hi, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. I just want to start off by thanking all of you for the opportunity to be here today so that I can actually put some real clothes on for the first time in a week. So, I mean, earlier in this week, I was, I've been taking so many classes that on two different days at like four o'clock, I realized I was still just wearing my pajamas and I would run and dash into the shower to take some, you know, get some real clothes on before my husband came home and thought that I was doing nothing all day. So not that I was doing nothing. I've been frantically trying to learn everything like all of you and research everything and, and really see what's going on out there. I have to tell you, I was told that there'll be over 2000 of you on this, um, this platform with me today. So I'm really excited about that. I do have to say though, that I can't answer all of your questions with that many people. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to show you my email in a second. I'm going to show it to you again at the end, please email me if you have questions. If I don't cover something, I promise I will be happy to talk to you offline and make sure I cover whatever it is that you need. So I, with that, I will get started. A little bit about me. I am a national speaker, an author, an educator, a clinician. Um, I am an adjunct faculty at Penn Dental School. We actually had a three hour meeting yesterday just to hear all the things that we're gonna be doing at the dental school to prepare to go back into the clinics in the near future. And it's just mind boggling between the head coverings, the foot coverings, the full length gowns, all the stuff that we're gonna be doing to make sure that we and the other staff and all of our patients and students are all safe. Um, I'm also on the advisory board at Penn College, of, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Palm Beach State College down in South Florida. I'm an alumni board member at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm the president of the Penn Dental Hygiene Alumni, which we're trying to bring into our regular dental school since the program hasn't been, has been defunct for a number of years. I'm a member of the Canberra Coalition, the American Academy of Cariology, the American Academy of Pediatrics section on oral health, and I've been doing dental missions around the world for probably 15 years now. Uh, recently, I've been taking student dental students down from Nova Southeastern a couple times a year. We go down and we do all kinds of fun stuff with the students. So it's so amazing and rewarding. And it's been a lot of fun to do that. I've done a lot of cleft lip and palate programs as well. So um, that's kind of a little bit about me. One thing I didn't say in this little bio, which I'll show you in my next picture, that I was actually born and raised in a dental office. So this is a picture of my mom. This is me. And my claim to fame, okay, so no, for those of you who don't know me, and I know I have a lot of friends on here with me today, but my claim to fame is that I invented, or I was the first clinician to do sit-down dentistry. So that's me working on my mom. It's 1962. So if you have a picture of yourself doing it before 1962, then 
please share it with me and I will relinquish my title to you. But you know, you can see how old it is based on some of the equipment in the operatory there. Um, so it's kind of, it was a, it's been a fun journey for me. So I would like to thank Plan Mecca and LM Dental. Now LM Dental is a, Plan Mecca is the parent company to Plan, uh, I'm sorry, Plan Mecca is the parent company and LM Dental is one of the subsidiaries of it. So I wanna thank both of them for all of their um, work and making sure that we could all be here today and have lots of fun and learn lots of new things, I hope. But my disclosure is that I am actually involved with all of these companies. I have done something with all of them over the last year or two. I write articles for them. I might evaluate new products. So all of these companies and I work together and it's been a really rewarding, really exciting opportunity for me over the you know, last 40 years since I've been a hygienist to work with these companies and do lots of neat things with them. My newest disclosure, if for those of you who have never been on Hygiene Town, those of you who are hygienists, I strongly encourage you to sign up on the Hygiene Town platform. Um, I'm doing some new things there. It's called Judge for Yourself with Judy RDH and then Tips from the Podium. So every um, couple weeks, there's a new Judge for Yourself opportunity for you to learn something new, to see a new product. And then the Tips from the Podium are just cute little tidbits that I like to share from some of my different experiences, some of my um, people I've met over the years and experiences people have had, as well as some of the ideas that I like to share in my programs. So if you haven't, if you're not a member of Hygiene Town, please take this opportunity to look at that and maybe, you know, you can join up and we can have dialogue on there as well and learn about lots of new products. So this is the page I wanted you to take a screenshot of or just write down a couple things. My email address is judy at judybendit.com. My website is judybendit.com. On my website, I encourage you to go open it up and at the top, there's a tab that says product link. If you open that up, you will see absolutely every product that I talk about. And from there, you click on a picture of any product, they're broken up into categories, and it will take you directly to that manufacturer. I do not make any money doing this. It's just something that I thought was important for me to get you to the right sources. And whenever possible, I tried to get you to the professional site rather than to the consumer site. So it just depends on what the product is, but it's an opportunity for you to go through and just click on different things and learn about some of the other products that I talk about in my different types of courses. So again, this is me doing stand-up dentistry, 1962, I think this was, and you can see the equipment. Look at that old x-ray unit there. If you look in this picture here, the, how many of you remember that old belt-driven handpiece and the rheostat that went with it down on the floor was that gigantic box that we had to put our foot on, and every time I'd use it, it would pull my hair out. It was such a nightmare to use that. Well, Obviously, we've changed, changed quite a bit over the years. And the problem is, is when we changed, unfortunately, as my friend Garfield says, it says I'm a creature of habit, all the bad ones. When we all went from standing up to sitting down, or those of you who started, you know, recently, not everybody talked about ergonomics. It really wasn't really a focus. And I'll walk into dental schools all the time and, I, and, and hygiene schools, and you know, it's interesting because we don't take the opportunity to really teach our students as much as we should on ergonomics while we have that opportunity. So when I speak at dental schools and dental hygiene schools, I'm telling everybody to please use this opportunity, you know, to ask the faculty, hey, come over here. I'm having trouble. I can't figure out how to do X and such. Can you show me how to reposition me or reposition my patient so that I can get in there and see a little bit better and be more effective and efficient at what I'm doing. So I think that, you know, we need to start looking at some of the bad things that we're doing because I'll walk into offices all the time and I'll say, oh, by the way, um, I saw you and you were doing one of these and guess what? You know what you'll say to me? Uh-uh, I don't do that. We deny all the time. None of us ever want to admit that we might not be doing things the way we really should be. So it's really important that we learn how to do these so that we can stop some of these bad habits before they become really big issues. So some of the occupational related factors that we have to deal with, number one is our posture. And those of you who are sitting in a chair right now tend to sh usually shimmy up and wiggle and get, you know, try to get a little bit more better posture for me. 
the repetitiveness of what we do all day long, the force or pinching of instruments. And I always say this comes because we don't stop to sharpen our instruments or to get the right instrument. We just say, oh, I, you know, I'm late for lunch or I'm late for the end of the day. I can make, I'll just make do with what I've got in my hand right now. And sometimes we hurt ourselves in doing that. Mechanical stress from some of the instruments we use, the vibration, some of the older hand pieces, some of the older ultrasonics, they really vibrated. And what that did is it actually exacerbated problems that we may have had in the carpal tunnel or the cubital tunnel or you know, different parts of our arms or our shoulders and neck. And you know, it, it just, we're all connected. So sometimes one little thing can really start setting lots of things off. The, so the vibration is an issue. If you're, some of your equipment is really old, you might notice that that's a problem. And then the funnier one is the temperature of your room. Many of you might not think that that's an issue, but how many of you have a hygienist or an assistant that's going through menopause? Think about that. And all of a sudden you're nice and, uh, you know, uncomfortable. And the next thing you know, the heat's going on or the air conditioner's going on and, and you're going crazy. So optimal temperature in the office should be 70, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, I live down here in South Florida and I got to tell you, everybody's air conditioned and it just blows constantly. And, you know, you bring sweaters wherever you go because, you know, you know, it's always going to be cold. So to so dress for your office, wear a turtleneck if you have to, or you know, wear an extra lab coat or something like that so that you can be comfortable and not worry about somebody messing with that thermostat for you. But what's really happening, and, and typically when I'm sitting and standing in front of an audience and I ask the question, how many of you actually have pain now? And typically 75% of my audiences will raise their hand and say, I've got something bothering me, whether it be in their fingers, their wrist, their elbow, their shoulder, their neck, their lower back, someplace on them, they are experiencing all kinds of challenges. And this is actually a survey that was done by my dear friend, two, two of my friends, Cindy Purdy and Ann Guillaume. And hopefully tomorrow you guys will all be on to see Cindy talk. She's gonna do something tomorrow on teledentistry. But the two of them, did a survey a couple years ago asking people about some of their reported having one or more workplace injuries and 51% of the people had experienced that kind of an issue. 38% or two out of five had experienced musculoskeletal disorders. I mean, I have a friend who is an orthopedic hand surgeon in Allentown, Pennsylvania, who has so many patients that are dentists and hygienists who have experienced carpal tunnel. You know, we need to figure out, and we're going to talk about, you know, wrist flexions and extension and, you know, it's having the right um, glove and it's how we retract with our non-dominant hands and some of the things that we do that exacerbate some of these challenges. And a lot of times it may even be stuff that you're doing at home, your extracurricular activities that can, when brought into the office, cause you to experience more pain. You know, you may have been out on the golf course and instead of taking a cart, you walked around like this all day carrying your bag. It may have been that you were needle pointing. You know, now think about it. So we're all home playing games on our iPads and things like that. But, but one of the things that I think is exciting about where we are right now is this has given our bodies a chance to reset. You have a chance to actually get, we've been out of the office and hopefully some of your aches and pains have actually been able to kind of dissipate because you're not doing those bad things all day. So think about that. See if maybe that's something that's happening with you. But there have been some surveys done, and I know these two are a little bit older, but they still resonate. They're still, you know, it's still the same. But this one was done. This is dental hygiene. And basically almost 50% of hygienists complained of shoulder or tendonitis issues. Um, you know, almost th over 30% of neck back and spinal injuries, things like that. When you look at the ADA survey, very similar, but actually lower back is significantly higher from the work that we do. Sometimes, you know, sitting around a patient doing crown preps all day long, things like that. Sometimes we hurt ourselves and we have to figure out where our pain is and we have to stop and say, how can I fix this? Whether it's just repositioning you and your assistant, whether it's, um, you know, going and seeing, seeking help from a physiatrist or a chiropractor or a physician or orthopod, somebody who can help you identify things. I, I'm even hearing stories of people who are really working out with trainers and the trainers are doing some of those things with those big 
ropes and tires and actually causing significant pain for people from the sternocleidomastoid muscles and, and things like that, that, you know, we have to be careful. We can't injure those muscles because we depend on all of those as our core to do our job all day long. So it's really important that we identify that, you know, and hope probably the reason many of you are on here is to learn about what you can do to fix some of the problems that you're currently having. Because the fact is this, we spend most of our day, eight hours, 10 hours every day, working with slumped shoulders, leaning forward with our head cocked to one side, trying to see into that poor patient's mouth. I mean, that's the reality of it. And that's what we have to figure out how to solve and how to fix that problem. So the term here, ergonomics, there are lots of definitions of it, and I'm not going to get too technical. What I wanted to do by sharing this with you is to kind of just bring it down to a very basic terminology, the study between the relationship of the worker and the job and the environment that is being done. So the science of matching the job and the worker to each other. So if the, if the room is well put together, if your operatory is great, you can potentially do your job without being exposed to any, any, any you know, demands, any test demands of actually getting hurt. The problem is many of us as an employee, if you're an employee dentist, employee hygienist, as an assistant, we walk into an office and basically it's take it or leave it. This is what we've got. They're not gonna go out and buy you a whole new operatory. But we have to sit down and look at things and say, hey, you know, I might need your help with this because the last clinician that was in this room was 6'1 and I'm only 4'11 or, or, or 5 feet and I need to make some minor changes. Can you help me with that? You know, can we get my um, curing light closer? Can we get my instruments closer or, or all of the equipment that you need? So those are the kinds of things that I want you to start looking around your operatory. You know, some poor hygienists I've seen, they, they take an old storage closet and they dump a chair in there because they need to and they put somebody in a really tiny room. Well, you know, if you can't move around, if you can't get to your things, that can be a challenge. So the goal is that we have to really figure out is everything that you need in arm's reach? Can you get to the things you need and can you be effective with all of those things? And that's really what it's about. So the considerations that we're gonna look at today, some little bit of magnification, our stools that we use and, and some of the challenges, our patient positioning. We're not gonna to talk too much about scheduling today, except maybe at the end, uh, as it has to do with what's happening as we move forward. I think we should talk about it for a second. Access to our instruments. You know, think about your room layout. We're gonna talk about gloves and we're gonna talk a little bit about instrument selection. So those are the things that we're gonna do, but we have a new world. There's a new post-COVID-19 world. And I don't have any of the answers. And I'm here to tell you that, you know, none of us have the answers yet. I think that in the next couple months or next couple weeks, between the ADA, ADHA, they will have guidelines for us. But I'm watching all of these educational, um, you know, CE courses coming out, and I'm not sure what it's going to look like. But I can tell you that I'm scared about some things because if we end up in a world where we're actually really trying to barrier and protect the patient, something like this that they're using when they intubate, we can take ergonomics out the window because there's no way that we're going to be able to work effectively if we're having, if our hands are in two little boxes and we're trying to treat patients. So I don't think this is where we're going, but I'm just sharing that with you as something that, you know, could potentially be an issue, especially with really high risk patients, things like that, that we might really have to start looking at some of these different types of options. Goggles. You know, we, I don't know that we can get away anymore with just regular glasses and side shields. We may need goggles, but when we do that, what happens to our loops? So we have to think about that. And then if we're wearing a face shield, can we wear our loops? Can we wear a light? So we have to make sure that those things will fit over what we're wearing. Sometimes those face shields, if they stick out too far, things can still get underneath them. So what's the point? You know, obviously we still have a mask on, but we want to be as protective as we can. And so we need to look at all of these different things out there. Now, a friend of mine, her son um, just came up with this new 3D um, he made this on his 3D printer. I don't think we're going there in dentistry, but I just wanted to share that with you. Some of the in innovative things that, this is a 24 year old kid who came up with this idea, kind of using the idea from snorkeling, but I just wanted to share it with you. But when it comes to suctioning, 
you know, we have our slow speed, which I think is going to be out the window, but we have our HVE and I will share with you in a little bit all of the options that we have. But in a lot of the programs that I'm watching this week, they're talking about this. And this is only one option. It's called dentairvac.com. Um, the, uh, the Penn Dental School has these in the lab and they're talking about purchasing one for every operatory so that we can actually put this in front of the patient to help pick up all of the aerosols that are coming out. So we don't know yet what's gonna happen. And like I said, we need to wait and listen to what everybody tells us. But what concerns me is if this is in front of the patient, how can we work ergonomically and be comfortable for six, eight, 10 hours a day doing our job? So we're gonna to have to really play around with all this stuff. We're gonna to have to wait and see what everybody thinks we're gonna really need to do to protect ourselves. So back to my presentation. As we talk about things, we're gonna talk about things as being traditional versus contemporary. There have been a lot of these instruments and things that I look at, they've been around for hundreds of years. You know, I mean, dental, some of the dental instruments are from the 1800s, but we need to, we've been asking the companies and they're finally listening to us. They're finally coming up with things that are contemporary, that work better for us, whether it be just because we're sitting down or because they are just, you know, make more sense. But that's the exciting thing. So just to give you a couple examples, you know, some of the what I call redesigned, re-engineered type products that we'll talk about, you know, the cordless handpiece, the rheostat. You can now, some of these cordless handpieces, the rheostat's right in your finger. You don't even have to. I remember the first time I got one, I'm like feeling on the floor for a rheostat and I'm like, oh wait, it's not there. It's, it's in my hand. Then we've got some of the patient chairs that you know, some of them they used to be so big and wide to make the patient really comfortable, but then poor us, we couldn't get over to their face because we were so far away from them. You know, provider stools, making sure that we have a stool that works for us, having the right instruments, having the right loops for us, and maybe even some of the overhead lights. Now, I need to ask you guys all a favor. Please do not go back to your employers if you're an employee and say, I took this course by Judy Bennett and she says you have to buy me all these things. I will deny it. And it's actually being videotaped. So I have proof of it. I want you to sit down with your employer and say, these are some of the things that might help me be more successful, or these are the things that will make me safer, make safer for our patients. And let's come up with a game plan. You know, we might not be able to buy it all at, well at once, but let's talk about some of these things. You know, I had been at a dental hygiene school many years ago and I went through all these different instruments. And the next day I got this really irate phone call from a dentist and he gets on the phone with me. It was up in Wilmington, Delaware. And he says, I don't know what you think you are, but you know, who are you to tell my, this hygienist that I just hired that she needs 17 instruments on every tray setup? And I said, I didn't tell her that. I said, all I did was share with them all the different ideas you know, you all have the basic fundamentals in instrumentation. You know, these are some of the more unique ideas that maybe you want to add or maybe you want to replace. So as we go through, please don't, you know, misconstrue what I'm saying is you have to have them. If you feel that it's something that would make your career better, if it's for your patient population, then you should consider it. Okay, not everything is going to be right for everybody. But some examples of things as they've, as they've been redesigned or re-engineered. Remember back in the 1920s and 30s, I used to, my, I mean, my dad had one of these. They'd sit and spin it up and down and up and down. Well, now look at some of the newer, more advanced type, what we call ergonomic chairs, okay, or stools they are. How about that old headrest, the one, the one on the left here with that big, silly arm on the back, that ratchet that... So here I was in the late 70s, I'm at Penn Dental School, and they had those chairs. And we're supposed to do sit down dental hygiene. Well, every time we'd move, we'd bang our knees. So I would end up with bruises on all of my knees. Now, when you look at what we have now, they're nice and slim. And there's, you know, you can get at 12 o'clock, you can sit underneath there, and you can really take care of a patient. So that makes a huge difference, okay? Now, that light in the upper left, that castle light, my dad had that. That's what I got to use every day. I felt like I was a chicken in a rotisserie. It was just the hottest thing. It was, I had to use both hands to pull it over. We've, we've come a long way. As an example, Plan Mecca has one. You rub your hand, just you run your hand around the front, and it's just um, activated by motion. And then we have all these newer lights and stuff that we're going to talk about. So we've, we've definitely come a long way. Now, look at the hand piece. When my mom went to dental hygiene school in, the, in 1958, she had that little port polisher. Now maybe that's where we're going for the next couple of months so we don't produce an aerosol, but you know, think about the, the 
transformation to the belt driven and then on the lower left, one of those big, heavy, clunky ones. And now we have some really nice options when it comes to our cordless profi angles. So it's really exciting to see what we've got. So I'd like everybody to do me a favor and pick up a pen. Hopefully you have one nearby. And I want you to put your pen in your hand. And if you have somebody sitting with you, it's even better if you do it with somebody. But we do something in dentistry. Now your pen is acting as if it were your instrument. Now your instrument or your pen in your hand, we hold it typically in a neutral position where our arm and our wrist are all in line with each other, okay? But a lot of times we do what we call flexion and we also do things called extension when we bring it up, we extend the wrist upward. Now, when we have our hand in a neutral position, I want you to hold it obviously tighter than you would hold your instrument, but I want you to hold it really tight and I want you to try to pull it out and you'll see that it doesn't go anywhere. We have proof that when we start doing the flexion and extension, what tends to happen is we reduce the strength in our hands. So let's start with the flexion. Bring your wrist down with your pen, hold it down really far, and then try to hold it. And typically the pen, will, you just can't. There's not enough strength in your hand to do that. When you go the other way and you do your extension, same thing, okay? So basically what we know is that when you do this wrist flexion, you reduce your strength by 55%. When you do the extension, you're doing getting 25%. Now, why am I telling you this? Because when you are working, a lot of times you will do these flexions and extensions. And then you wonder, why can't I remove that deposit? Why can't I remove that cement? Why can't I do whatever that task is I'm trying to do? Because you're getting very frustrated. So we do all kinds of extensions and flexions all day long. How many times in your day do you spend your day, you know, with some patient who when you say open up and you get this, and then you spend all day with your non-dominant hand pulling that cheek to get them out of the way so you can do your job. So those are the kinds of things. So I want you to start really focusing on when you're, when you're working, stop and look, are my hands in a neutral position? If they're not, reposition the patient, reposition yourself, figure out how you can do your job depending on the tooth that you're working on in the surface to be neutral and be completely effective at what you're trying to do. Okay, now when I went to dental hygiene school, we learned something called classifications of movement. Classifications of movement are this moving your fingers are totally safe. We do it all day long, it's, there's no problem. Fingers and wrists, again, totally safe. Fingers, wrists, and elbows are very safe. It's the class four and five movements that we get into a lot of trouble with because we're constantly then reaching up to get something or we're twisting and bending. Okay, now unfortunately my next slide, it's the video is not working for some reason, but you know that chair you sit in all day long? Did you know that it actually spins? Okay, most of you they don't because you've never done it and all it needs is a little WD-40, but we spend all day long with our hands in the patient's mouth and when we decide we need something, we just take one hand away and we do this crazy class five motion trying to get to a countertop, trying to get to a bracket table, trying to get our air or water or suction or something. And we do all these crazy class four and five motions all day long. This one is the most notorious. You get your patient seated and guess what? You forgot the bracket table and you forgot the light. So instead of standing up and getting it and coming back, you just do one of these ridiculous reaches. And then you wonder why your neck and your shoulders are hurting. It's because of things like this that we do all day long. So you have to stop. Before you sit down, you wanna bring everything over, bring your light, bring your tray, bring all of your equipment in, in you know, reach. And we'll talk about what that reach should be. And then you sit down, okay? Please, please, please. We do this all day long and it is so dangerous for all of us, especially those of you who are my age and older, we're, we're getting older and, and, you know, things are starting to hurt without being in the office. So let's not make it worse when we're in the office. Okay. The reason for those class five movements being such a challenge is that when we do those movements, we put a whole lot of pressure on the sacrum and the intervertebral vertebrae, we actually start to squish them. And I'll show you a picture of this and some science behind it in a little bit, but you know, this constant bending and moving, what it's doing to our, our vertebrae and our, you know, the lumbar is really, really dangerous. So we have to be super careful about all of that, okay? 
There've even in textbooks, they talk about it as being an acceptable, you know, movement versus a compromise movement versus a harmful movement. So we have to really be careful and watching as we bend. Um, even in some of the textbooks, and I actually have taken this up with a lot of my students. I don't know if you have faculty. I know a couple of my friends who are faculty are on here today. I love putting tape on the back of people. So as they start twisting and moving, you, moving, you can see how it's changing. So, you know, this is my friend Barbara, and I actually had her just sitting there. And then as she turned around to nine o'clock, you could see how it's still nice and straight. And her arms are in a good position. Um, she wasn't wearing loops at the time, but, you know, she's comfortable. She can do her job. But, and you look at this one, that's a problem. Okay, we cannot sit with our legs crossed like this. Now, unfortunately, I, I heard of a dentist a couple of years ago who was sitting like this, but on the edge of the chair like that and ended up they had waxed the floor the night before and he ended up slipping off the chair and was out of work for months and months and months so please be careful we, if we only needed half a chair like it shows in this picture we'd only buy half a chair we have to use you have to get the full support of your chair you cannot just use a part of it you will end up hurting yourself now, when I, I went to dental hygiene school back in the 70s, and I don't know about any of you who went to dental school and dental hygiene school, but they never ever told us that we could use the patient's chest as an armrest. So please be careful with that. We don't wanna do that. We also don't wanna stand and ignore the hair because we know that's obviously a, a really bad situation, but bending over the patient, um, really bending over. I mean, look at her, she's got a, a mirror in her left hand. All she had to do is indirect vision and she would have been fine. She could have sat down, sat at 12 o'clock and done her job, gotten the stain out of the tooth number eight and nine that she was trying to get. So you really, really need to be careful, to try to be a little smarter about what you're doing and not to say, oh, well, it's just, you know, the, the thing we do at all dentists and all hygienists is we say, well, you know, I, Mrs. Jones, I don't wanna move her again. And, you know, I, I, it's only gonna take me 10 minutes. So we compromise and we compromise for Mrs. Jones. And then we compromise in the next hour for Mrs. Smith. And, and by the end of the day, we're feeling lousy because we've been compromising all day long just to, for the benefit of our patients. You know, if the, if the thing that makes me crazy was when somebody calls their office a spa and the patient comes in with the expectation that, oh, I'm just gonna sit there and relax and they're gonna just take care of me, no. You need to get your patients to work for you. When you say, I want you to move your head to the right and to the left and bring your head up, they need to help you so that you can do your job. We cannot just let them sit there and not participate in the process. That's really what gets dangerous for all of us and that's the, the, what we have to get them out of. So your options are standing up or sitting down. Now, I actually love to stand up every once in a while. I think it's really beneficial because it allows yourself to stretch and to strengthen those core muscles and, you know, give your body a break. You know, when somebody comes in and they can't sit back, don't fight them. Let them let's sit them up and let's try to do them standing up for a change. And we'll talk about strategies for that in a little bit. So standing up, sitting down, but what I don't want to see is you laying the patient all the way down and then deciding that you want to bend over and try to do stuff because that just doesn't work. Okay. I encourage all of you to take pictures. Now, a lot of my faculty that I talk to all the time, they say, oh, well, we don't let camera, you know, phones in the clinic, but they will allow the faculty to take them. So in offices, in clinics, in dental schools, hygiene schools, I encourage you, even if it's just in pre-clinic, walk around and take pictures of people, okay? I do it before the students ever get to know me. I walk through the, you know, the clinic and take pictures from a distance and they have no idea what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And then I take the, my, my pictures and I put them in my computer and we sit down at lunch and we start talking about all the things that I saw, which I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. So what's your most important instrument? In my mind, it's your eyes. Without our eyes, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't do our job. Um, so our goal is that we want to get the patient closer without bending over to see and to do our job. So if you're not wearing loops, I beg you to please consider it when you get out of this whole situation we're all in, next meeting you go to, uh, next time you can have it rep into your office, it's really important that you do this. If you survey friends of yours who were wearing loops and you said, would you do work without them? The answer is no, I wouldn't be able to work if I didn't have my loops. And that's 
how I feel about it as well. There was a survey done though a couple of years ago by a dear friend of mine, Mark Hartley, um, at the time he was with RDH Magazine. And basically he was looking at lots of different products and asking hygienists, do you purchase them yourself? Do you make the decision? Are you involved in the decision? Or does the dentist employer make the decision? And when it came to loops, you'll notice that it's the younger range of people and higher percentages that bought them. And the reason for that is in some states, it's actually a requirement that all students, all dental students, hygiene students in some states are required to actually buy them and use them anytime they're in the clinic. So some states it's, it's you know, it's an, um, it's not mandatory. I wish it were mandatory. I wish every dental student, every dental hygiene student had them. If you're not wearing them and your boss is, you're at a significant disadvantage because you're not seeing all the stuff that they're seeing. So I really encourage everybody to wear loops. Couple quick things about loops. Number one, obviously it promotes your neutral posture. It helps your neck, your shoulder, your back. It's gonna decrease the fatigue because you're not doing all that bending, reducing your risk of musculoskeletal disorders. It's going to improve your clinical outcome because you can actually be able to see better. So it's much better from that standpoint. And because of all this, it potentially will extend your career longevity. So you can work a lot longer. You know, I have very dear friends who are dentists and hygienists who have put years and years into their education. And, you know, I have some friends who are prosthodontists and periodontists who can't work anymore because they hurt too much. You know, for whatever reason, they've got all kinds of musculoskeletal issues and have been forced to retire way too early than they wanted to. So please, you know, take care of yourself. Make sure you try, you know, different things that will help you so that you can, you know, keep doing what you want to do. Okay. So the things that you want to consider when it comes to loops, the resolution, magnification, the field of width, the depth of width, all of the depth of the field, excuse me, those are all important things. To me though, one of the most important things is like a dental hygienist should be at at least a 2.5 diopter, maybe even some want more. Um, dentists typically want a little bit more than that. But if you look at this picture clinically, you know, when you're, when you're probing, Okay, just as an example, just one little thing. Look to the naked eye, the one all the way in the far left. You know, this is pretty easy because it's a type of dot. Okay, now put it in the mouth where it's kind of dark, where there's a lot of blood, where there's saliva, where there's a tongue and cheek and all this other stuff getting in your way. And it can take a long time to actually do a complete charting. Think about you're working on the lingual of tooth number 18, for example, and there's a bunch of blood pooling there. So you put it in, you pick it up, you pull it. Down. You know, we spend hours trying to do probing, trying to get that measurement. Well, once I put on loops, I can see it a lot quicker and easier. So I can get through the process much, much faster. So that's one consideration. So just depending on what you do in the office, that will depend on the magnification that you're looking for. We have through the lens, we have the flip ups. My preference is through the lens. I think that that's gonna, that's, um, they're lighter. I think that I don't want people to be able to adjust them themselves because then they change the, the, the um, pupillary distance, they change the declination, they do all kinds of things that end up creating problems for them. So I think that's a concern. So these are the, the things that they're going to measure and whatever company you have, don't do it unless you've got a type it on or a patient in front of you so that they can actually measure that angle and the distance that you're looking to be working and have your prescription and all of those important things to decide what's right for you. Okay. And you have to take time to get used to them. Do not take a pair of loops and just jump into the office on day one and start wearing them. Take a little time, do maybe one procedure in the morning, one in the afternoon, maybe the two the next day, you know, build up for, with that. Maybe just do your comprehensive exams with them and then don't use it or just use it for polishing. You know, just get used to them, okay? Because one of the crazy things is because the oculars at the bottom and you have the space at the top, people tend to just do this and then they wonder why they're getting motion sickness. So you gotta get used to them. I also suggest taking them home and polishing your nails on the weekend. You know, put the polish over to the side and look in the front, have your nails here and actually bring them into your focal distance so that you can actually practice doing that just like you would with an instrument so that you're not taking your head and going back and forth trying to figure out what you're doing. I think it helps make it a little bit easier. Do some puzzles with it. Do something to make it a little bit easier for you when you transition back into the office with them. So I bring in this picture of the lights again because what we're seeing is a new kind of change in some of the dental offices. What I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is offices are setting up new operatories and they're not putting an overhead light. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I've heard people who temp 
And when they temp, they're being told, please bring your light because we don't have an overhead light. Okay, they're trying to get rid of it, whether they're putting a TV up there, whether they're putting something else up there, a mural, people have eliminated that light. And so you need to have some kind of light. So the reason for that light comes with that movement that I was talking about before the classification and that class five movement that we're trying to eliminate. So as I said, we, you know, we're constantly grabbing for that mirror. But more importantly, every time you tell your patient, can you turn to the right or turn to the left or bring your head up, you have to readjust that light. But if the light's right here, you don't have to do that. It's following you wherever you are going. So it's a really nice thing to consider having some kind of a headlight, okay? And there are lots of different products. There are corded ones, there are cordless ones, and they really make a difference. They really help to make enhance your outcome. So I really like some of them. This is the one I actually use. And what I love about it is they're little batteries that actually just go into a USB and into a regular outlet. So when I do a lot of mission work, I take a bunch of the batteries and I can get through a couple of days with them. And it's just, it's lightweight and it's, it, it's really comfortable. And I just like having my light right there. So there are lots of different products and companies. I just wanted you to see that that's an option. The question is gonna be, will it fit if we have to wear a shield? And we don't know the answer to that, okay? so. Keep your eyes and ears open and we'll hopefully work this out together, all of us. Now, another thing that's happening is a lot of companies are looking at the actual color that's being emitted from those lights. And how many of you have ever gone into a Home Depot or Lowe's and you go to the lighting light bulb section and they have these big boxes and you can stick your hand in and look at all the different colors under the light? Well, they call that CRI, which is Color Rendering Index. And in dentistry, it's really important that that color be as close to natural as possible because we're looking at inflammation and bleeding. We're looking at color to, to make, you know, crowns and bridges. You know, color is critical. We don't want to have, you know, you can't go out and buy one of those Duracell lights and expect it to have great color and clarity that you would have with a really good quality light. So I just wanted to share that with you as well. That's something that's kind of new, but will make your job a little bit easier. Okay. Next, we want to talk about finding the right stool. Now, <laughs> this is what we see. This is what I was talking about in the beginning. Remember I said the fact is we, we bend over, we hunch over our patients all day long. We have to figure out how to solve that problem. Because when we do that, like I said, that traditional seating, we, we actually are rotating our pelvis. And so our goal is we need to bring our body, our hips down so we can reduce that pressure there. I don't know, I know I'm getting cut off here on my screen, but our goal is, you know, if we're flattening the lumbar spine by sitting at a 90 degree angle, that's not good. We want to make sure that our hips are higher than our knees, whether you be in a traditional stool or whether you be in one of the newer ergonomic type stools. Our goal is not to be sitting at 90 degree angles anymore. We need the science, the ergonomists have been telling us we need to get our body, our legs lower than our body, lower than our hips, so that we can be a whole lot more comfortable. So this is what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about the, the pressure, the disc pressure. When we sit, when we're hunched over like we are with that patient, those two clinicians I just showed you, the disc pressure is 190 percent more than it is, you know, which should be 100 to be natural, but we're almost double the pressure that we put on those discs when we hunch over. So please, please, please think about that. Make sure you're sitting up, make sure you're sitting, you know, considering a different type of a stool to get the job done. But when you go to buy a chair for yourself, what I don't want you to do is go to a convention, sit on a chair for five minutes and say, I'll take it. I need for you to talk to the company and say, hey, can I borrow one? Can you have a sales rep bring one into my office and let me use it for a week or two? Make sure it's a chair that you want to be making that big purchase with. Okay, that's really the important thing. So you want to decide, does it feel comfortable when I sit on it? Does it fit my shape? You know, I've sat on chairs that the thing is so big, the seat pan, that when I sit back, I can't even get my knees off the edge, so my legs are dangling in the, in the air. That's not going to work for me. So we have to be comfortable. We want to make sure that there's a backrest and that it's adjustable and that the height adjustments will fit you. So one thing I do tell everybody is, remember I said sometimes you might be really short and the last person was really tall or vice versa? 
there are a lot of companies that will just sell you a new cylinder that you can put in. So you can go to your boss or you can go to the supplier and say, hey, this chair is not working for me. And before we think about investing in a new chair, can we just consider replacing that cylinder? Because I need something that's a little shorter. I need something that's a little bit taller. So those height options can be really helpful for a lot of different patients, okay? So back to my considerations, you know, does the CPAN feel comfortable after I've been sitting in it for an hour or two? If it doesn't, then it's not the right chair for you. Now, some people actually want armrests and they're different armrests, some that move with you, some that don't. Be really careful if you've got one on the left side and you're doing, remember what I talked about before, turning your chair to get something? You gotta be careful that you actually bring the chair back because if you don't, you're gonna hit your patient in the head. So there's a learning curve. Make sure you practice, you know, practice that before you go in and work with a patient. There's some now that have this fabric that breathes so that you don't stand up and everything sticks to the chair because it's too high. So those are considerations that I want you to think about. Now, how many of you, I'm gonna take a quick second here to take a drink, hold on. I'm sorry. How many of you, when you were in elementary school, got in trouble with your parent or your teacher, especially if you went to a Catholic school because you sat like this girl in that little insert, you brought the chair forward. That was a big no-no. And some kids would tell, people would tell me they used to get their um, hand slapped with a ruler if they did that. And I remember my mom used to say, you know, Judy, a chair has four legs for a reason. You're gonna break my chair if you sit on two legs. But you and I had, we, we kind of knew something. We were, we were smarter than everybody else because what we realized is look at that little girl and the, the blonde down the bottom. As she sits forward, notice how her hips have come higher than her knees. Notice how she's taking a lot of the pressure off of her lumbar and she's a lot more comfortable. So if you guys are sitting, if any of you are not sitting in an office chair, if you're just sitting in a regular chair with four legs, Prop yourself up a little bit and see how it just immediately takes that pressure off of your back and you're going to be a lot more comfortable. So I just wanted everybody to think about that. Okay. But, 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 but think about anybody who rides a horse. Have you ever seen anybody with bad posture? Never. They sit perfectly, whether they're sitting on a, a Western saddle or an English saddle, they're always sitting upright. It's amazing how they sit. So we took, you know, people, companies took that idea and brought it to dentistry. And I saw this picture recently. It's like, oh my gosh, I got to show everybody. Cause it's like, it per totally typifies what we're trying to accomplish. Look at how perfect his, um, his back is, how comfortable he is. Okay, now this next pic, well, this is the, the angle that we're trying to get is nine to 14 degree tilt. So if you can accomplish that, that's really helpful for all of us. Now this next picture, don't get too excited about it because with this whole new COVID-19 thing, I don't think we're gonna be able to have our doctors wearing this uniform. So um, I think that we're gonna have to have a little more clothes on than this, but just to kind of get the point of, you know, the, taking the pressure, your spine, your spinal cord, you're not leaning forward. If you try to lean forward, you get uncomfortable. So it forces you to sit better. Okay, that's all I can say about ergonomic chairs, helps with your, the curvature, it helps maintain your neutral pelvic um, you know, alignment, it's more balanced. It's almost like when your, your feet and your legs support your whole core, it's like a tripod. You're sitting so comfortable, it feels so good. It strengthens your core. And guess what, when you're rolled over like that, you can't take a deep breath, there's no way. But when you're sitting in a saddle stool, you can take a nice big deep breath when you need it. Nice cleansing breath, just like you would in yoga, just to like kind of reset yourself for a second or two. So it's really important that you think about a saddle stool for your next one. Now, traditional seating, you can still do this with. So for instance, if you look at this chair, he's sitting traditionally, but now watch to, when I try to make it more contemporary, he brings a chair up a little bit and he makes that tilt, that nine to 14 degrees and look at that. So his his hip is higher than his knees and he's a lot more comfortable. Now I'm gonna show you a quick video here just as something that I just learned about that Plan Mecca makes, just so you can see like an example of a contemporary new stool. Okay, 
So hopefully, yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ones. You know, I don't, I don't know if you guys are familiar with crown seating. Um, I mean, even some of the bigger companies, the, the, you know, the ones that make your operatory chairs, you know, ADAC, everybody's thinking ergonomics now. So you should be asking, you know, do I have one just up and down or can I do different things? And, and that one was actually new because you could just touch it with your foot and bring it up and down. So I thought that was kind of neat. All right, the next thing we want to talk about is patient positioning. This is one that is just such a challenge for most of us. And I, I, I hear your pain, especially for the hygienists in the room um, who are listening to me. It's so frustrating because sometimes I feel like that you, you, know, you push the button and they're counting two seconds and they scream, stop, stop. I don't want to sit back that far. And they drive us crazy. And we know that they can sit back because we know they do it for the dentist. So, you know, I even find this when I'm in a teaching situation, if I'm the faculty, they'll do it for me, but they won't do it for the student. And that, so here I am, that same faculty, and then I go into a clinical situation and I try to get somebody to sit back and they won't do it for me either. So it, it's funny how everybody, you know, we have to figure out what to do. And there's lots of little hints that, of things that I can share with you either, you know, I'll share some of them now, I can share some offline if anybody still needs some ideas, but I had it practiced many years ago that I put a little check note. This is back when we had paper charts. So whenever I knew somebody was going to be a pain in my you know what, before they came in, I'd put the chair halfway back and I'd get them comfortable at that point. And so when I went to put the chair back, I would actually, when I would do it, I'd get them where I needed them to be and they wouldn't complain because they were already halfway there. I've had some friends who say to me, Judy, I put them back further than I want them. You know, I mean, you know, a dentist can basically put them on their head and they'll do whatever they want. But I will put them back, you know, they'll say to me, I put them back down further than I want. And when they say that's too much, I bring them back where I want and we're okay. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do next time you go back to the office, whenever that is, whether it's next week or next month, I want you to say something a little differently. Normally we push the button and we say, okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm gonna put you back. Well, I want you to change that. I want you to say, okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to push this button. I'm going to push you, put you down, and I'm going to get both of us comfortable. And you know what? It's going to start a conversation. They're going to say, well, you never said that to me before. And the answer is, you know what? You know, in all this time I've had to reflect while I've been home, I've realized that in order for me to do my job well, I need to be comfortable. So in order for me to do this, I need to get you down a little bit further. And if you really can't lay there, I mean, I know you do because I know you only sleep with one pillow, so I'm not going to get any further than that. But if that doesn't work, then, you know, just give me a chance. If that doesn't work, we'll sit you all the way up and I'll do it standing up. But I'd really like to try to get you down where I need you to be so that we can both be comfortable. So think about that. See if that helps you to motivate your patient to do it better for you, okay? I've had one hygienist who came in one day, this was the best, and she said, Judy, she raised her hand in a class and she said, we figured it out. I said, what did you do? She said, every morning when we have our morning huddle, if we have a really problem patient and we all know who they are, she said, we'll discuss that when Mrs. Jones comes in, the doctor will come in, greet Mrs. Jones, say hello, put her back and say, I'll be back in 45 minutes or an hour to see you again. It, it works for them. Now, you know, moving forward, that might not work because changing, you know, our PPE might be a problem, things like that. But, you know, something to think about, okay? But when they say stop and you're not there, you can't do it. You cannot do what this picture is showing because you will absolutely hurt yourself. Okay, and these are examples, as I said, I take pictures of dental students when I walk around the clinics. And these are the things that you can't do. The one in the middle, that woman sat there for over a half an hour like that. There's no way it's not, and, and then she yelled at me. She said, well, how else am I supposed to suture? Well, you know, we have to figure out. You have to practice doing it the right way, okay? Bring the patient, the whole chair back up. Bring the patient back further if you had to. Bring the patient's neck up. And, and there are actually some things that you can use to help you to make it better. Now in the mission world, talk about backbreaking. These are some of my students from Nova Dental School. And look at that. I mean, they actually don't have headrests, so they use their leg. And we sit there and we bend. And then sometimes I'll make one of the floating students come and pretend to be the headrest for a couple minutes just to give the clinician a break. So you gotta think about what you're doing. So again, standing up, sitting down. Um, you know, as far as our neck, when we, we sit forward exponentially, as you bring your neck forward, it gets heavier and heavier. So they always say our head is about the weight of a bowling ball. 
So about 12 pounds. But look what happens when you move it two inches further off the, your spine, off your, you know, cervical, your cervical vertebrae, look at that, 32 pounds. And you take it three inches, it's now 42 pounds. And you sit there like that for hours and you wonder why does your neck hurt? It's pretty obvious to most of us why things like this happen. And now the newest thing is um, texting. You know, we walk around with our neck down like this and we're getting muscle tension and pinched nerves and herniated discs and exacerbating arthritis. And so we've got to be careful. You know, what, have your phone up higher. We can't be walking around like that. And we can't be walking around and using the phone. So we got to be really careful with stuff like that. Think about your receptionist. Is she still using a traditional phone and holding it to one side? You know, get her a headset, him or her headset. Make sure that they are ergonomically sound so that they're able to do their job properly. This is what I was talking about. You can actually buy pillows. There's a couple companies that make them where one side is thicker and the other side is thin. And so when you want them to be to work on the mandible, you put the thick side, you look at the bottom picture, you put the thick side in the back, it brings her head forward so you can see the mandible better. And then you bring her head back by switching it and putting the fat part at the bottom of her neck and the thinner part. So that brings her head back up. She's really comfortable because it's this viscoelastic foam and it helps you to do your job better. It helps you see the things that you wanna do. And then don't forget, you also have the articulating headrest most of you have. So you can adjust that. Don't forget about that. Make sure you use that, okay? So what does a cat do when they wake up? Most of you will say stretch, but my cat does yoga. Not really. What do you do when you wake up though? Unfortunately, what most of us do is we just start running. We run upstairs to get the kids to, you know, start make, run back into the kitchen and we run, 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 especially if you have young kids, you're doing all kinds of stuff. We don't take time for us. So a couple of years ago, um, actually it's more like 10 years ago, um, one of my participants at one of my classes who happened to have been a physical therapist who saw a whole lot of dental professionals came to find out what was going on and why we were having all these problems. And he raises his hand, he says, Judy, Every day you take a shower. Yes, I do. Great. Every day I want you to take the temperature of that water, make it really hot, make it steamy, get in there and do some stretching exercises. And at the time I had younger kids and he said, and if you have to lock the door so that they can't bother you, but take five or 10 minutes for yourself. And I'm telling you every day I do that, I just stretch down, I put, let the hot water beat on my back, on my shoulders. It's amazing how much better it makes me feel. So it's not just stretching, but it's that moist, heat that really helps as well. So I think that's something to think about for some of you who might have some challenges. Okay, sleep we know is a real problem. You know, most of us don't wake up like this. We end up waking like this. It's like, well, though, in the next last month or two, I'm not sure if we're waking up, we're getting to sleep or not. Everybody's different. But I took a class yesterday that talked about stress and how important that seven, you know, hours or nine hours of sleep is. So you need to get uninterrupted sleep. So think about that. Make sure you're getting that. Because if people were meant to pop out of bed, we'd all sleep in a toaster. Ha ha. Oh, well. <laughs> anyway, take a second now. Try some of these exercises while I'm talking. You know, could you do this in your operatory behind the patient while you're waiting for the doctor to come check? Absolutely. Can you do this while you're, you know, outside your operatory, while you're waiting, while you're waiting for anesthesia behind the patient? You can do all these things. I mean, the middle one of this, the middle one where I've looked at if she's got her legs folded, you can do that while you're talking to the patients, you know, finding out about the kids. I mean, stretch your body out. Make sure you do this every day. Grab the door as you're walking out and do a nice big stretch as you're leaving your operatory. The funny story I have is that people used to tell me how much they're upset that we did away with the dark room. And they, they, I used to question well, why? And they said, because I used to go in the dark room and I do all kinds of exercises and stretches and, and nobody could see me. And now all of a sudden I've got to do it out where people can see me and they don't like that. Oh, well, get your stretching in every day. You cannot sit there. Humans were not meant to sit all day long. And even now, like I have a bicycle right behind me here. And I, a lot of days I'm doing my, some of these CE programs, I'm sitting on the bicycle trying to get some exercise, trying to keep as active as I can during these times, okay? Access to your instruments, 15 inches is ideal, but you wanna look around the operatory, figure out, you know, is my light where I need it to be? That my light curing wand, is my air and water, is my, my um, ultrasonic, everything you need, you wanna make sure it's close enough. 
There's a company called Zerk, and Zerk actually makes some little mobile trays that you can attach to a side of a cabinet or you can attach to a pole that you can bring some of your things closer. So if that's something that you need, that's a, certainly something I would think about. Um, gloves are a consideration, okay? You wanna make sure, look, do a checklist of your gloves, you know, especially now. Do the fi finger lengths okay, the palm width, the length of the fingers to the cuff, is it comfortable, is it too tight? How does it feel, the overall fit, the consistency well, from one box to the next is important. So all of these types of things. Now I'd like each of you to just put your hands by your side. And I want you to just look down at your, your hands and I want you to notice where your thumb is. Is your thumb anterior to your other hands or when you're doing it, is your hand straight as it, as it does in the picture? So the blue glove on the bottom is probably what your fingers are looking like. But my challenge is that many of you are wearing ambidextrous gloves and wondering why you're getting all kinds of pain and discomfort in this area of your hand. Well, the reason we're having different, some challenges is because an ambidextrous glove, the thumb comes out here and you can put your right hand and you can put your left hand in. And then unfortunately we spend all day long with our fingers in a, in this position holding instruments and pens and whatever we're holding and we cause a lot of stress and strain here because our finger has to go twice as far as it does when we're using a right left specific glove. So I just wanted you to know about that. Now this was something funny. I saw Kara RDH put this on. It says suction, hurry, I cannot swallow my own saliva. Well how many times a day do we laugh at our patients who we, we've got saliva in their mouth and they insist they have to spit out because God forbid they swallow their own saliva. But I wanted to kind of use that to transition into the different types of products. And I, I saw one question when we first started is, you know, are you gonna talk about isolite? Well, there is isolite and isolite is the first one that came out and it's a fabulous product. It's got a mouth prop and it, it protects and it, it sucks everything out. It's high volume evacuation. The only thing I have a problem with with this is that they're all, that one is a disposable product. So it's a one-time use and you throw them out. Then Dry Shield came out and Dry Shield is almost the same without the light, you have everything else, but it's an autoclavable version, okay? And then Mr. Thirsty came out and that one's just another disposable option, but these are all using the high volume evacuation. Now the two top ones, the Blue Boa and the Mirror Suction have been two that I love. However, moving forward after this whole COVID-19 thing, I don't know that the diameter of those is gonna be okay to use as our only suction. It might be as an adjunct. So we might be able to have two high, high HVEs and one we can use for this uh, and for mirror and the other we can use for high volume evacuation. Um, Densply just came up with one called the PureVac. That's another option. The nice advantage to it is that the tubing is very big. So they, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of stuff at once. And the nice thing about it is it also has a little mirror on the end. So sometimes you can use the mirror to see. So there are lots of options. Um, it's gonna be, you know, let's, let's look and see what happens. But if you have one of them already, you're in good shape. Um, if you don't, I would definitely be looking at these different options so you can see what you have. If you're still using just the straight um, tubing, you know, with the whole thing, a tip on the end, I just wanted to share one new thing with you. It's called the ErgoVac. So if you look at the bottom one, instead of it being straight up and down, it has a right angle. So you don't have to do that flexion and extension. You can hold your hand more neutral. So I think that's an important consideration for you as well. Okay, so let's jump in. I know I'm already, yikes, I'm, I'm, I have a couple minutes left, but we're, we'll just give me five minutes and we should be in good shape. So jumping into the mouth, these are considerations. The handle diameter, the weight, the balance, rigidity, the length of the shank, and the handle, the instrument design are all important criteria, criteria by which you should pick your instruments. Do not just pick instruments based on price. Try them, see if you like one over another. You know, what is it that you like about the instrument? And, and those are, you, you need to just tell the person who does your ordering exactly what you want rather than letting somebody else pick for you. There are lots of different variations, lots of different handle sizes, lots of different weights of instruments. And now everybody has even different proprietary things that they make available for us so that our instruments will either last longer or not maybe last as long, but never have to be sharpened. So we would love our instruments to last forever. The instrument companies will never do that for us. 
Unfortunately, dental instruments, a lot of the dentist instruments, a forcep, a plug or a burnisher, those will last forever, but hygiene instruments will not. They have a life expectancy, typically six months to a year, depending on the instrument. So we have to be careful. And, but I wanted you to see, you know, as an example, LM Dental has one called the ErgoSense. It's, you know, very sharp, it lasts longer, um, less maintenance to do on it. Some of the others out there, XP Technology, some of you are familiar with, EverEdge. So there's lots of proprietary things by different companies. So you have to see what it is that you like. You know, as an example, they're light, they have larger diameters, which were important, um, non-slip coatings, great tactile sensitivity, lots of different colors. So there's lots of different things out there. Now, Rigidity is important. You, you cannot just have one rigidity, especially going forward. I need for all of you to think about if you can't use your ultrasonic when you go back to the office because of aerosols, you have to have either rigid or extra rigid instruments in your office because you're not gonna be able to use that ultrasonic potentially. So standard instruments are great for light to moderate calculus. The rigid is for moderate to heavy deposits, okay? And then some companies actually make extra rigids that are good for heavy or tenacious deposits. So you need to make sure you have the right instruments to do the job. They also have different shank options. You have the old original that was designed in the 1950s by Dr. Tracy, one that's a little bit longer, then you have longer with a shorter blade, and then you've got you know, lots of micro minis and things like that. So lots of companies with lots of different options. Okay, some companies call them pocket scalers and after fives and deep pockets and extended reach. You have lots and lots of different options, but I just want you to see the difference. The one on the left is standard Gracie, the one on the right is the the longer shanked instrument. So it's gonna get further subgingivally without you having to you know, reach around and bend and twist and contort yourself to get where you need to go. Mini blades, you know, when people tell me that they only buy the regular and after they sharpen them a couple of times, they're mini, that doesn't work. Because when you look at this tooth, that anterior tooth with a regular Gracie, that blade is huge and there's no way you're gonna ever get it in there. So you have to buy mini bladed instruments for the anterior teeth, okay? For the posterior teeth, there's the 1112, which is the old one. I never use the 1112, now I only use the 1516. If you have questions on the 1516, reach out to me, we can talk about it. The 1718 is the contemporary version versus the old traditional. Um, for those of you who forgot that the companies came up with mesial distals, I don't know if you remember that, you take the Gracie 11, 12, 13, 14 and mix them up so that you have an 11, 14 and 12, 13 so you can do one arch and then flip it to do the distal or the mesial, whichever one, and it's a lot easier so you're not picking up and putting down as much. So that's a consideration. The old traditional sickles, remember the old jackets and the 204 series? Now we have so many different options. We have the, um, the Sharp Jack, we have the Nevis, we have the Montana Jacks, we have all these different variations from different companies of really neat contemporary new sickle designs, okay? My Langer Curette, I can never work without it. It's the the shank of a Gracie 1314 with a universal blade. It's my favorite instrument ever, so I highly recommend that one. The original LM Syntet is perfect on molars and provides an option for safe subgingival depuration. Working in interproximal areas is efficient due to the fact that one single fulcrum point can be used when removing calculus on both distal and mesial. So I apologize because I, I want to get through this, but it's one blade that instead of having, I'm sorry, it's two blades but it does the mesial on the distal. So it's a very unique instrument. There are a couple companies that have it. You should definitely look at that if that's something that interests you. Um, but I just want to share it with you. We're almost to the end here. My Cordes is a dental hygienist who invented this so that she's got something. Look at that. The cord is held on by your, on your wrist by a little rubber silicone type bracelet. And if you look at the difference between, you know, trying to finagle, if you look at the picture on the left, trying to hold the, the, you know, the, the extra hosing so that you don't have any of the pullback versus having it on your wrist, it makes such a difference. So look up Cordy's if you have any questions. It's also on my website as well. Speaking of cutting the cord, okay, all of these great new cordless hand pieces that I mentioned in the beginning, if you haven't tried one of them, you absolutely need to. 
Um, I definitely think they're great. And then the last thing, Cindy Purdy and I were actually at a meeting and bumped into this company and fell in love with these compression socks. And now I wear them all the time and I wear them on planes and I wear them when I work and they make my legs feel so much better. And I hope that I won't have varicosities as a result of because I'm wearing them, it kind of eliminates some of that. So they make my legs more comfortable, especially if I'm sitting all day long in an operatory, okay? so. These options are, you have to pay attention to your body. When your body tells you something hurts, figure out how to fix it. Because it starts off as stiff muscles and then you start taking NSAIDs and then you have to take time off from work and then you're seeing all kinds of you know, specialists to help you and then you might need surgery and then unfortunately some people end up with new careers as a result of things that happen. So exercise, strengthen your body, yoga, stretching, you know, look at some of these products I talked about that will help your life be more you know, easy, easy to do your job, your loops and your um, indirect vision, proper seating, all of those things. So we talked about a lot of these different options. Usually this course is over three hours and we kind of really mushed everything into an hour and five. So thank you for your patience. Thank you so much for giving up an hour of your time. I promise if you send me emails, I will do my best to answer all your questions. Um, that's all folks. And again, I'm gonna end with my um, thank you to Plan Mecca and LM, as well as my information. If you wanna to talk to me, um, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to get in touch with you. So thank you again for everything. And um, I'll turn it over to Jody. All right, thank you so much. A lot of great comments. I hope everybody's sitting up a little bit straighter. And <laughs> I'm standing. <laughs> Everybody probably shifted a little bit when you saw some of the, sure. those images. So <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> All sure. right. We have a lot of questions. Um, I just want everybody to take a quick look at her slide here um, with her email address and website because I am going to flip to another slide that gives a little bit of information about. But just take a screenshot of it if you need to, guys. There you go. Judy at judybed.com. I love it. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and. Um, hopefully I can get my, oh, Sid, I don't know if I'm going to be able to share my uh, thing and answer questions at the same time. All right, so I'm not going to, but I'm going to uh, give a little recap of um, what we need to do for CE credits. So always the biggest question at the end of these. Uh, so the uh, AGD subject code is 550. Uh, it is one CE credit, and the CE survey link should be available now in the chat, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom page. Additionally, we will be sending a follow-up e email tomorrow morning that will include the CE survey link as well as the recording of the webinar. So again, in the chat feature, you will now be able to access the survey link. Um, some people says it's, act it's a little finicky when they click um, from the chat. So if you have any issues, please be patient and wait for your follow-up email, which you will receive tomorrow morning, along with the webinar recording. I know I sound silly, but we get a lot of emails um, <laughs> with asking a lot of questions. So just wanted to make sure that we were clear. All right, are you ready for the questions, Judy? Yeah, there's actually one here I'd like to cover and I, because I thought it was important. Somebody, um, Jessica, I think just asked a question about a hunchback patients. If they're in a wheelchair, I just want to share that there are a couple of manufacturers. I know ADAC actually makes the chair back so that the headrest will actually just flip the other way so that you can bring their um, wheelchair right up to it. So there are kinds, lots of new accommodations for special needs patients that I'm seeing a lot of different options with. And I just thought that would be important to bring up. So go ahead, you asked me a couple other questions. Kim. Yeah, so we had several people just ask about the instrument that you just mentioned that your, was your favorite and everybody needs to have. So it's called a Langer Curette. And it's taking uh, the, the shank, all the shanks of a Gracie and putting a universal curette on the end. And I always say if I were in a deserted island, I wouldn't go anywhere without it. But they make, there's three or four in the set usually. The only one I use is the Langer 3-4 and I use it with the longer terminal shank. So the after five or however the company di differentiates, it depends on each company. But it's a pic picture, a, um, your favorite Columbia or Barnhart or McCall, but with a couple extra angles to it. It's amazing. Great, and then there were a couple questions um, about face shields and which ones work the best with loops and light. We, I don't know of any yet. So let's keep our eyes and ears open, <laughs> keep watching. 
And then do you have a recommendation for the brand of loops that you like best? Um, I hate to do that. <laughs> um, I personally wear Oroscoptic. I like them a lot. Um, I, I do some consulting for them. They've been um, very, uh, you know, we, we work well together. I've also worked with Surgital. They have a great quality product. I, as I always say, you get what you pay for. So you can find inexpensive loops, but you'll end up replacing them. You'll be frustrated. So in my mind, you need a good quality loop. So there are probably three or four of them that I, I would recommend. Okay. So Orscoptic, Surgital, Q-Optics, those are my, those are the top three probably. Great. Do you know if there's any um, detrimental long-term effects of wearing loops? So I've asked that question of lots and lots of ophthalmologists. And what they actually say to me is that it actually is really good for your eyes because you're not wearing them all day long and you're not looking through them all day because sometimes you're looking through them. Sometimes you're looking at your computer screen. So what it's doing is it's strengthening the muscles in your eyes and actually making your eyes better. But if the, if the declination isn't correct, if the, the distance isn't set properly, you know, can you be uncomfortable and have some challenges? Absolutely. Um, my recommendation is find a company that gives you a 30, 60 or 90 day chance to work with the loops. And if you don't like them, you can return them or they'll tweak them for you or do something like that. I know a bunch of companies do that. So think about that. All right. Uh, one question was about patient positioning and somebody who has very hunched backs. So that's um, the one I just answered. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Was, so, so if they're in a wheelchair, there's, that's easy. If they're not, I mean, it can, I, I know exactly what you're talking about when they're all hen, hunched over and it's really hard. Um, sometimes, you know, you just have to bring the chair back a little bit further if they can tolerate it. But, it, I, I, you know, sometimes I, I just think if we just work with them sitting up, sometimes we're better off. So it, it, it's just a personal thing. I don't have any magic cures. Okay. Um, and somebody stated that they've been standing for the past two years and wants to know if there's any uh, long-term detrimental impact on standing all day. Nope. Same patient. Nope. nope. Okay. Um, any uh, thoughts on ball chairs? Um, a lot of people like them. The problem with them is that the air comes out, so you have to keep pumping them up. The other problem with them is that multiple people use them and they're different heights. It's hard. You have to take the extenders on the bottoms and pull them out and pull them. Put, you know, so it's, it, if two people are using the same operatory and they're the same height, it's fine. If they're two different sizes, that can be a pain in the neck. Some people, they take air out, they inflate them, you know, just to make it accommodate multiple users. But I have no problem with it. The only thing I say to you is I actually have one sitting right here. You have to put your hand behind it when you go to sit down. One day I, I went to get on it and I didn't do that and the chair flew out from under me and I really got hurt. So be very careful with the ball chairs. No, okay. no, no fun. And I think you mentioned that pretty much all of the products that you talked about are on your website. Is that correct? Yeah, they can okay. see find everything. Now I saw a question there also about retipping. Um, I do have some articles on it if you need help with your boss. What I need to tell you is there isn't one instrument company in the entire United States that will ever retip an instrument. I used to think when I, you know, broke an instrument and I sent it back, I was getting, you know, it was they were retipping it. What they were doing is they were sending me a brand new one. There are retippers out there and what they do is they take the the original company's handle and they pull out the old one and force fit a new one in. There's lots of liability issues. There's lots of challenges with it that, that you don't know where they're getting those tips from. They're from all parts of the world. They're not the same quality that you're used to. Sometimes I'm, I'm people will call me laughing because they sent back curettes and now they, they sent back sickles. I mean, so, so retipping can be a real challenge. And what most people will find is if you take a retipped instrument brand new and a new instrument and you, put different bands on them, you cycle them, you'll find that you'll replace the retipped instruments much more frequently than you will some of these new um, types of, you know, um, metallurg metallurgic con con um, op options that we have. So there's lots and lots of new neat things out there, but you're not going to get them from retippers. Do you have any recommendations for hypermobility in the finger? I don't. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, is the PureVac card on your hand? I don't think so. I mean, I've used it a number of times. I, I, I don't know if the patient's asking because they had a problem with it, but I find it comfortable. Um, it's like the, the, the cord is so lightweight that you really don't feel it and you're just, uh, you're holding it and it's not a problem. 
All right. How can you use cordless hand pieces when we are now sterilizing our hand pieces for every patient? So two of the companies, um, Densply and um, Premier, both have an autoclavable sheath that meets all the CDC guidelines. So when you get the motor, you also get a couple sheets and you can even buy more. So as long as you have like a statum in the office so that you can cycle them more quickly, you take one off, you put it in, you put the next one on. So they meet all the guidelines. Great so. question about whether or not you can purchase loops with uh, health savings accounts. Do you know? Um, HSA? Probably. I mean, I don't know. It's like I have a credit card and I can just use that credit card with my savings plan. So I would imagine I could do that. So, and some people okay. get real creative with their bosses if they're an employee and they say, will you buy it and then take a certain amount of money every month or every couple of weeks out. So it's using pre-tax dollars. So I'm not paying as much. And so some people get real creative. Some companies will work out financing with you for your loops. I know they do that for students. I'm not sure if they do it for everybody else, but it's definitely something to think about. All right, then there, this was an interesting one that somebody um, just learned about on another, uh, another webinar. Have you heard any contraindications to the face shield trapping aerosols underneath while working with loops? Not working with loops. I'm just worried about them, you know, I mean, with anything, I'm just worried about, because I said, if there's all this, this space around them, so depending, I mean, you've got a mask here, and then you, I don't know if it's how close it's going to be, whether it's going to touch or stuff's going to go around it. I mean, I'm not really sure. That's why I showed you that picture of that one that looked like a scoop of mask. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think we know yet. I really don't. I think it's something that we just need to keep our eyes and ears open to. I think we don't know what we're going to be doing, what it's going to look like, whether we can use our ultrasonics or we're going to just do hand or we're going to use our, if we're going to polish, you know, we might be selective, we're back to selective polishing and really selectively, you know, we might be doing toothbrush polishing. Who knows? I'm not sure what we're going to do, but we all have to keep our eyes and ears open and find out what the guidelines we get are to make those decisions and make them, you know, wise decisions. Um, do you know where the uh, folks can find information on the PPE requirements? I know that the ADA has, is working on their next you know, round. Yeah, ADA, of CDC, I mean, you know, we're, every, it, it, there's nothing yet. Just keep, keep looking, you know, get, get your name on the list for the ADA or just go keep going to their website, get on their mailing list for right now, just so that when the guidelines come out, you're getting copies of everything, you know, live. So as that would be my recommendation. All right, and somebody helped answer the question about the help, the HSA that loops are no longer tax deductible if you are a W-2 employee. All right, um, a couple people have asked about the wireless loops, um, the brand th that those were. But there are a couple companies, the one that I showed you, which is the one that I have is called the Spark and it's the Oroscoptic version. All right. All right, I think we've pretty much uh, made our way through the questions. We appreciate your time, Judy. Um, again, for those of you that are still on, and uh, the CE survey link will be in the chat and will also be emailed you, to you tomorrow morning along with the webinar recording. Have a great afternoon, great evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye, thanks. Thank you, take care.